we are discussing the life of Paul, and last week we uh, were, uh, among other things, talking about the things that Jesus told Saul of Tarsus. And that what we see in Acts chapter 9 and what we see in Acts chapter 22 with Paul retelling it and Acts chapter 26, Paul's retelling it again, that time to Agrippa. In 22, it is to a mob that wants him dead. Uh, that he puts in details that uh, Luke doesn't put in chapter 9. But Luke does put, Luke, Luke writes the whole book. Luke does put it in in chapter 22, other things in chapter 22, and other details in chapter 26. He's, he's putting it all down. And uh, one of the things, well, a major thing that, that Christ tells Saul of Tarsus on the road that we don't get in chapter 9, but we do get in chapter 26, is that Christ says, I've separated you, and that I am going to I am going to make you a minister and a witness of the things you have seen and the things I will reveal to you. And so he does get the gospel from Christ. He doesn't go to Jerusalem to confer with anybody. Uh, he doesn't he's not getting uh, his teaching from as he says, from flesh and blood? He doesn't. He's getting it from Christ. Now, he did not get the plan of salvation, but from An Ananias gave that to him. And we're going to see that. Ananias tells him, because um, Jesus says, you'll go into Damascus and you'll be told what to do. And it's Ananias that's going to tell him what to do. But we see in Galatians uh, chapter 1, and verse, beginning in verse 11, But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man, for I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ, which is precisely what Jesus said He was going to do. Now, in verse 16, still Galatians 1, To reveal His Son to me, that I might preach Him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood. He didn't, he didn't learn it from anybody else. He learned it specifically from Christ, which is precisely what Christ said He would do, is that you're going to be a minister and witness uh, of the things that you've seen and the things that I will reveal to you. So it's going to be given to him, it's going to be given to Saul of Tarsus, not by some other apostle or, or some other teacher, but it's going to arrive by way of inspiration. It's going to be given to him directly. Now, last week we talked about the men who are with Saul, that uh, they heard the voice, they saw no one, they saw the light that was there. It's about midday. They see this light, this enormous light now shining on them. They all hit the ground. They heard the voice, but they didn't understand what the voice was saying. And no doubt... With uh, now Jesus, we know in chapter twenty-six. I mean Acts. Uh, no, Acts chapter. Yeah, Acts chapter twenty-six and verse fourteen, that um, he spoke to them in spoke to. Um, no, it's wait a minute. Is it twenty-two or twenty-six? Let me look at that. Um, twenty-six fourteen. Does that say he spoke to him? Yes, he spoke to him in Hebrew in 2614. He speaks to him in Hebrew. And no doubt, Paul responds in Hebrew. But they, uh, the men who are there have no idea what the voice is saying. They hear it, see no one, but they don't understand what the message is. Message isn't for them. It's for, it's for Saul. And I have, I don't know if we, we talked about this last week or not, and perhaps we did, but I, I have wondered what happened to those men. Where, what happened to them? They knew something happened, and they knew it was from God. They knew that. There's no other explanation. And, and Saul may have told them what just happened. I would expect he probably did. 
but I don't, I don't have proof in that. But I wonder what happened to those men because they lead him. Yes. Yes, Saul. No, the other men were not blinded at all. Matter of fact, if they all were all blinded, they, they would all have to be led. But they are the ones that lead him precisely where he's supposed to be going. Uh, they, they haven't been told anything different because the message isn't for them. They haven't been told anything different. And the idea was that they are going to Damascus, which is what they continue to do, and that they are going to take him where they were going to take him, which was the house of Judas on, on the street called Straight, on Straight Street. All right, That's, that was their destination. They're not told to go there. Saul is not told to go there. Now, Ananias is told to go there because there is a Saul of Tarsus who's there uh, who he needs to talk to and heal. Ananias is told to go there, but Saul is not because that would have been where Saul was going, evidently. Now, he's led to Damascus. Now, let's look at, uh, we spoke briefly, ending up last week in Acts chapter 9, looking at verses 10 through 14. And, uh, well, actually 10 through um, yeah, well, 10 through 16, all right? And that um, we see the vision that Ananias has and what Ananias is told to do by Christ because Christ speaks to him by name, Ananias. That's verse 10. That's Acts 9, verse 10. And he says, here I am. So the Lord said to him, go to the street called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tar Tarsus, for behold, he is praying. He is there. All right, this is what you're going to do. Now, Ananias lives in Damascus. He knows where Straight Street is. Go there, go to the house of Judas, and you're going to find Saul of Tarsus there, and Saul of Tarsus is, is praying. And in a vision... He has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. Now, this is an interesting way to, to do this because Ananias is told Saul has seen a vision, which means God's involved in this. Not only is he told to go visit Saul of Tarsus, who's praying, but he's telling Ananias that I've sent him a vision. I have sent... Uh, I've sent Saul of Tarsus a vision that a man named Ananias will come and heal him and that this is, this is something that God is involved in this. He's involved. Now what makes this interesting is that we're, we're not told it from, from Saul's perspective that Saul was asleep or Saul was mourning or Saul what. Was, was sitting on, the, on the, the floor or whatever he was, and that a vision came to him. We're not told that. We're told this from Christ telling Ananias, this, has, this is what has happened, and, and, which is an interesting way of doing it. It's a very interesting way of doing it. And also, it's giving us the information, while also giving Ananias the information, that... Uh, God is leading this man. God is leading this man, this Saul of Tarsus. Now, uh, let's go to uh, Acts chapter 22 and beginning in verse 14. Yes. He was a righteous man. Yeah, that was it. Yeah, that's all we know. He's obviously Jewish. He is now a follower of Christ. He lives in Damascus. Uh, he has a good reputation with the Jews there in Damascus. There's, there's no problem with him whatsoever. That he, is, he has a very good reputation. Now he's a Christian, but he has, he's, he's a devout man, and he has a good reputation there. 
He has that. And uh, now, uh, but actually in chapter 22, Paul says that in verse 12, Then a certain Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having a good testimony with all the Jews who dwelt there, who dwelt in Damascus. That's, that's all we know, really, of him. Uh, is he originally from Damascus? Maybe. Uh, did, could he have gone there a few years earlier out of Jerusalem? Maybe. But he's, obviously he's, he's established. He's been there a while. But the likelihood is, in my book anyway, likelihood is he, he's lived there a long time. That's, that's uh, the way I take it in this. Now, what we want in this is, and we'll just continue in verse 13, is what Christ told, what Christ told Ananias. Now, we've already seen what chapter 9 said. Now, this is a direct quote from Ananias himself being recounted by Paul. All right. Uh, came to me and stood and said to me, all right, this is Ananias came to me and stood and said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that same hour, I looked up at him. Then he said, The God of our fathers has chosen you that you should know his will and see the just one and hear the voice of his mouth. So there's another part of this. He's already heard the voice of his mouth. He's already heard that. That's, that, occurs, uh, that had just occurred about three days earlier from this point. He's already heard from Christ. But he's going to be hearing more, as we've already stated, because he's going to be inspired. And Christ is going to teach him. Now, to see the just one, and see the just one, and hear the voice of his mouth. For you will be his witness to all men of what you have seen and heard. All right? And so, uh, this is what uh, Ananias was told. Now, Ananias is not doing this as a, a direct quote, or Paul is not doing it as a direct quote of Christ, but it appears that uh, Ananias has been given some information in this to where he's summing it up. The God of our fathers has chosen you that you should know his will and to see the just one, hear the voice of his mouth. Okay, that's information that we didn't get earlier necessarily, but he, and not all of it, but he's summing it up, not as a direct quote, but he's summing it up. This is what he knows. Now, let's go back to Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9, we see what Ananias does in verse 17. Now we've seen some of it there in uh, 20, Acts 22. But now, let's look at this. So Acts 9, 17, And Ananias went his way and entered the house. So uh, he has, he has uh, Christ has spoken to Ananias, and then and Ananias went his way. And in this, how much time was it from that point where Christ says, go to the street called Straight, and Ananias going? It doesn't really say, but it's probably not very long. He's in the city. He knows where the, it's, it's extremely convenient for him. Just go to the street that's called Straight. He's a local man. He knows where it is. And I would suggest it was immediate. Christ tells him to do that. Okay, let me get, let me get my sandals on. He's, and, and away he goes. And so Ananias went his way and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, so he knows that, has sent me to you that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately there fell from his eyes, that's Paul, Saul's eyes, something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. Now, he did. He's about to, yes. He's, he's, he's about to. Now, uh, that you may receive your sight, he's, that hasn't happened just yet, next verse it will be, 
and be filled with the Holy Spirit. That hasn't happened just yet, but it will. All right? And so there fell from his eyes. So what Saul saw in the vision comes to pass. Here's Ananias enters the house of Judas. Ananias is there and he receives his sight. And Ananias is also going to tell him what he must do. Ananias is going to tell him that. And so he received his sight at once, but something like scales. All right? Something like scales does not mean scales. It's something like scales. All right? I don't know what that would be. And I don't have to have a medical explanation. It doesn't need to be one. He is blinded miraculously. God did that. And he is healed miraculously. And uh, it could have been like the, the sensation of, or it could have been actually something like scales. I don't know. But the main point in all this is he received his sight. All right, he gets it back. And as, as we said previously, if Saul refused Christ, okay, he's going to be blind for the rest of his life. I, I have no doubt about that. This is, this is going to be him blind for the rest of his life. And, uh, but he's immediately healed, and he arose and was baptized. Now, we're going to see... In Acts 22, that Saul didn't just decide on his own, that is, come up with the idea, I need to be baptized. No doubt he would have known that's what Christians were doing. No doubt he would have known that that's what John the Baptist had been doing. There's no doubt about that. He hasn't been living in a closet, he's not been. Even, even if he had been up in Tarsus all that time, which he wasn't, even if he had been in Tarsus, never heard Gamaliel's voice ever, even if he had been in Tarsus, there is no doubt among the Jews they would have talked about John the Baptist and they would have talked about Jesus of Nazareth and the followers and the things that were occurring and that there was baptism involved for the remission of sins which is precisely what John the Baptist was preaching and Jesus was preaching while he was here on this earth. This is for the remission of sins, to have your sins remitted or forgiven. All right? Now, we come to this. We go back to Acts chapter 22, and Ananias, after he says... For you will be his witness to all men of what you have seen and heard. Now he tells him what he must do. Because right now he's not told him what he must do. He's just said what God has done. He's chosen you that you should know his will. See the just one and hear the voice of his mouth. All right, That's uh, not what you must do. That's not a what you must do because all of this is going to happen uh, and God's going to make, God's going to make that happen. This is, this is Saul being a passive, being a recipient of this, being passive of uh, it's chosen you. He, Saul didn't do that. Know his will. Saul didn't do that. See the just one. Didn't do that. Hear the voice of the mouth. He didn't do that. But now he's being told what he must do. Lord, what do you want me to do? Go to Damascus, you'll be told what to do. Now, Ananias says, And now, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. So he tells him what he must do. Saul is still in his sins? Yes. And I had a conversation with a, a fellow. I've told you about this conversation before. It was a long conversation. And uh, he did not believe in baptism at all. And he liked arguing. 
That's what he liked to do. And so he calls me up. He, he's not even in the state of Georgia. He calls me up because he's calling random churches and wants to talk about this. And what he said, because he, he, he dismisses, because this man dismisses baptism, he wanted to say, he didn't want to say, he did say, Ananias got it wrong. What? Ananias got it wrong. Ananias, you'll be told what to do, and Ananias messes it up. He's the one to tell Saul what to do, and Ananias messes it up. But I, I told him, I said, but wait a minute. In Acts chapter 22, years after the fact, Paul is saying what Ananias said, and Paul does not correct it one bit. Paul doesn't correct it. Paul is saying precisely what Ananias did, precisely what he did, but he doesn't say, and that was a dumb idea, so, uh, and Ananias got it wrong. He doesn't say that. Now, now why, would, why would he want to recount this to all these people anyway if Ananias got it wrong? If he's in front of, of all these, these men who want him dead, and he's recounting as to what occurred to him, why is he not among them anymore? He left them, joined himself with Christ. Christ added him to the church. All right. Why, why would he tell him? Why would he tell them? And this is one of the false doctrines I received. That would be ludicrous. That would be like him reciting, oh, and let me tell you about the church in Corinth. And let me and what they were doing wrong. And let me tell you about the, the church in Galatia and churches in Galatia and what they were doing wrong. That's that would be ludicrous. He is telling them what happened. Did Ananias get it right? Yes, he got it right. And Saul, now Paul, the apostle, here in Acts chapter 22, is recounting it. Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. So Saul. Let's look at this. Verse 14. Then he said, this is, this is Ananias saying what Christ told him. And he's summing it up. The God of our fathers has chosen you that you should know His will, see the just one, and hear the voice of His mouth. For you will be His witness to all men of what you have seen and heard. All right. Now, notice he was chosen. He's going to know His will, see the just one, hear the voice, and be witnesses. God has chosen him for a special task. He's going to be the apostle to the Gentiles. That's not to say that no other apostle could teach a Gentile, because it, obviously you can. But he's going to be specifically the one that's going uh, mission work into the Gentile world. Okay, now after, after all this, after all this, he still is in his sins. Yes. Okay, Emma. Well, that would, be, that would be an occasion. Did he see him again? It's very possible he did because Christ does talk to him at other places, like when he's in Corinth. Christ speaks to him directly. Don't, don't be afraid. I've got plenty of people here. Don't be afraid whatsoever. And, uh, and also, Christ is going to speak to him in Jerusalem of, you got to leave. Christ is going to tell him specifically, you cannot stay. you got to get out now. And so, it, that would be the first occasion, yes, but I think there could be many other occasions when he did. Nevertheless, if we just count Acts chapter 9, that does it. Yeah. And so, uh, uh, anyway, so we have um, how he is saved. How does he wash away his sins? Ananias tells him. Ananias tells him what he must do. So, Let's just for the, the arise and what? And wash away your sins. 
uh, be baptized. Now, does he, does he not already have faith in Christ? Yes, he would thoroughly believe, thoroughly believe that Jesus of Nazareth is the Christ, the Son of the living God. He already believed in Jehovah. He already believed that there would be a Messiah. Now he knows exactly who Messiah is. Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Okay, he doesn't need any more information than that. He now knows. He knows. So does he have faith that Jesus is the Christ? Yes. Has he been already been chosen as a special vessel to go to the Gentiles? He's going to, going to preach to the children of Israel and to kings and rulers, already set apart to do that, do the bidding of Christ. But he's still in his sins because Ananias says he is. Did Ananias get it wrong? Well, if Ananias got it wrong, Paul doesn't correct it because it's Paul recounting this. Paul doesn't correct it because it doesn't need to be corrected. That's the truth of the matter. He was still in his sins. Very much like uh, in Acts chapter 10. Let's just go there. I realize this, this is not about Paul. But Acts chapter 10 there was a certain, uh, beginning of verse 1, there was a certain man in, in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian regiment. All right, now he is a Gentile, and Peter is going to have, uh, Peter is, is going to be teaching this Gentile. Now notice what it says, a devout man and one who feared God with all his household, who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. All right, now, so he, this, this particular man, Cornelius, he's not persecuting the church. He's not doing what Paul did. He's, he's seen as a righteous man. He's, he's praying to God. And still, still, he has to be saved. And uh, that's precisely what's going to happen. Uh, and he is, he is told that he must hear the words that are going to be given to him, and Peter is going to tell him what he must do. And, uh, and so he, he, the, Cornelius and his entire household are baptized, and they, uh, uh, Peter is the one that brings him the message the, uh, in verse 47. Um, of, of chapter 10. Can anyone forbid water that these should be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. In, in the name of the Lord. Then they asked him to stay a few days. So the same thing happens with Cornelius. Cornelius is in need of this even though he is a very good man. And uh, so we have we have Cornelius, who is very similar, very similar to someone like Saul of Tarsus in this. He didn't persecute the church, no. But someone who, who is um, a good man, Cornelius, and God is, is giving that, that summation, giving, giving that judgment on him by these scriptures. And yet he still must be saved. He's a good man. He's not been baptized. He must be saved. He's good, but good is not what gets you into heaven. Good alone is not what gets you into heaven. It can't. If it could, then, then there was no reason for, for Peter to go see Cornelius whatsoever. Now, um, let's, let's continue on with, with Paul. So, we have... Yes. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, that's correct. Okay, so I need, to, I need to go, I need to say what you just said. In chapter 10, verse 4, And when, when he observed him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? So an angel has come before Cornelius. Your prayers and your alms have come up for memorial 
before God. So, his prayers are seen as legitimate prayers. They're seen as legitimate. All right. Does that mean, does that mean that Cornelius is saved because his prayers are received? No, it doesn't mean that at all. Uh, last week, I think it was last week, Bob spoke on this of does God hear the prayers of sinners? And it, it is like this, and what, what, what Bob put forward is precisely what I believe, and precisely what I think that the Bible teaches. Someone who is seeking God, God will, and, and is praying for that, God's, God's going gonna to hear that. Just as Christ said, He said, ask, seek, not. All right, that's from, the, that's from the Sermon on the Mount. He's not talking to baptized Christians. He's not talking to them. Now, they're there, yes. He's, this is a lot of folks. And that's an assurance to all of them. Ask, seek, knock. Is that prayer? Well, if it's not, what is it? If it's not prayer, what is it? How do you ask of God and not pray to God? How do you knock and not pray to God? Okay, how are you doing that? And that someone who truly is conscientious, truly out to seek God, God will hear their prayer. He will help them. Yeah, the regard. Yes, and it's, it's a matter of regarding a prayer or not. But we can see in the, in the Old Testament where there were times when Israel, with Israel, that they had gone beyond a certain point, and it's like God already closed the door. Is okay, that's it. I've sent you prophet after prophet, time after time, year after year. I've given you all these things. You're just as stubborn as it gets. It's over. It's over. And when the hammer comes down, it's too late to be praying. For them, it's too late. Because he gave them time. Uh, and uh, it's, it's too late when, uh, when the, the fire and brimstone are hitting Sodom. It's too late for Sodom to pray. It's over. It is, it is absolutely over. And uh, now, uh, let's, go, let's go back to, uh, to uh, Saul of Tarsus. And we go back to chapter 9. Now, we have seen what Christ said to him, what Christ said to Ananias, what Ananias did, what he said to Saul, what he told Saul, what Saul did, and now we see what happens next. Because what happens next is not what anybody expected. It's not what anybody expected. So we come to chap back to chapter 9, and we go to verse 19. So when he received food, okay, so he's, already, he's received his sight, he arose and was baptized, and we see from chapter 22, it was, it was Ananias that told him that's what he had to do, to wash away his sins. So when he had received food and was strengthened, then Saul spent some days with the... Uh, with the disciples at Damascus. So he's been three days without food. All right. So he needs, he needs a, uh, to eat and to be strengthened. All right. He receives food. He's strengthened. He spends some days with the disciples. Verse 20, immediately he preaches. All right. This is, this is what Saul does. He preaches the Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. Those synagogues knew why Saul of Tarsus was coming there. Ananias certainly did. Ananias knew why he was coming there. Ananias tells Christ why he's coming there. He, he, says, he, he says that, uh, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. Okay, and so he's coming here. Now, Ananias doesn't say he's coming here. 
But he knows what this man does. Those synagogues would have known why Saul of Tarsus was coming. They would have known. But now he's preaching Christ in the very synagogues that he was going to, to go searching out for Christians. And the Christians, why would they, we answered this a few weeks ago, why would the Christians be in synagogues? Because first off, they're Jewish, and it is to the Jews first. They would not be going to the synagogue to worship God on the Sabbath. They would be doing that on the first day of the week, the next day. But they would be going there very much like Paul did later on the missionary tours because that is in very much like what Christ did, but that is of teaching the Jews first. Well, where are you going to find them? You're going to find them in the synagogue. That's where you're going to find them. And uh, Saul does that repeatedly in his, in his missions. So he goes to the synagogues to teach those who were prepared for the Messiah concerning the Messiah. Let me tell you, let me preach the, about the Messiah, about the Christ. Yes, that is a great idea. And then telling them it's Jesus of Nazareth and telling them the Christ has, has come and risen and ascended into heaven and He reigns now. Okay, verse 21. Uh, yeah, well, in, in a synagogue, as we can see from like Luke 4, when Jesus goes uh, back to Nazareth, and uh, yes, there would, be, there would be your basic acts of, um, of worship, but they couldn't, uh, there were no sa sacrifices at a synagogue. That's got to be at the temple. But there would be hymns, there would be prayers, there would be, as we see, with Christ, the reading of Scripture there, followed by comments, because that's what Jesus does. They expect a comment from Jesus. When, when Jesus reads from Isaiah, is reading from Isaiah 53, when He reads that and puts the scroll back down, all eyes are fixed on Him. Of, it's not as though, okay, well, He's through, through reading, He's going to, you know, that's that. They expect him to say something. And so there would be a, a teaching, a preaching that would, have, that would have gone on in the synagogue. And so Saul going in here, they would have received him, brother Saul. They would have received him and they, oh, he's got, he's got education from Gamaliel out of Jerusalem. Of course we're going to let him say something. And now he begins talking about the Messiah not a foreign subject. We all know about the Messiah, but it's Jesus of Nazareth. Okay. Some would not want to hear that. They wouldn't want to hear that. But that's precisely what he's doing. Then we come to verse 21. Then all who heard were amazed and said, Is this not he who destroyed those who called on his name in Jerusalem? And has come here for that purpose, so that he might bring them bound to the chief priest. So they know why he's there. This is not the message they expected. Now someone like Judas, where Saul had been staying, would have known from the beginning something's, something's up with Saul. He would have known something. And I have no doubt that he would have witnessed what Ananias said, and what Saul did. And perhaps, perhaps I can't, you know, the men who had, were with Saul, they might have seen it as well. Now what happened to Judas of Damascus? No idea. Or those men have no idea. But here we see where they're all confused as to, What's this about? Verse 22, But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving, proving that this Jesus is the Christ. 
He can prove it. So already he's been getting, given information. He can prove it. And really, it would be a matter of, of being taught here, you know, from, from uh, Isaiah, here from David, here from Moses, here from Joel, here from Daniel, here from these others. And now let's look at what Jesus just did. Let's look at him. Let's look at the timeline. Let's look at the tribe. Let's look at every fact about him, that everything is precisely as described from the Old Testament. Nobody else can do that. Nobody else can say that they are even close to, to matching what uh, uh, these, these prophecies and that, that somehow one could, you know, one could be born of, uh, uh, of David, that, that is, a direct descendant of David, and born in Bethlehem. Okay, but there's a whole lot more than that. There's a lot more than that. And, uh, but Jesus does that in all the rest. And He's able to confound them, and He's able to prove that Jesus is the Christ. Which, yes, you can prove that. It is proven from the text itself. As we have said on numerous occasions, it's impossible for Jesus of Nazareth to be something other than the Christ. It's not possible for Him to be just a good man. It's not possible for Him to be a, a blasphemer. It's not possible that someone else could be the Christ. It is Him only. And it is absolutely on a rock. It is, it is without mistake provable and that it's impossible for something else to be true other than that. Something else uh, contradictory to be true because uh, he, is, he is the Christ. And Saul is able to do that. Now next week we'll continue with what happens in Damascus and then what he does immediately after Damascus. Uh, because while chapter 9, Acts chapter 9, has him going immediately into Jerusalem, so it would seem, actually there's a time period that is there of where, yeah, he does go to Jerusalem, but there's something in between leaving Damascus and going to Jerusalem. And we get that not from Acts chapter 9. We'll get that from the book of Galatians as he's, uh, Paul writes to uh, the churches in Galatia of what, of what occurred. And um, I appreciate everybody being with us this morning. And uh, we will continue next week. Thank you, everybody.